For right now, carry on, he said. Evan, I'll expect my next briefing by ten o'clock. I should be back in the residence by then. Yes, sir, Stroud said. There were a few more mumbled thank you, sirs, around the table before the screens went blank again and the president was gone. He'd said all he needed to say. I looked down at my watch. It seemed impossible, but it was only a few minutes past 6 a.m. Bree would be getting off work about now. The kids would be waking up and starting to get ready for school after their day off. It sounded like President and Mrs. Coyle would be headed back to the White House. And two murdered policemen's families were going to have to start piecing their lives back together this morning. It was another day in Washington, D.C., and none of us, the ones who were supposed to protect the city, had any idea what it would bring. Chapter 39 Hala woke up first, as she almost always did, but something was different, she sensed. No, she knew something had changed. For the better? It was the sound of the Atan, the sound of home ringing out from somewhere nearby. She raised her head to see where she was. Tariq was still asleep on the metal cot across from hers. Shelves of paper towels and toilet paper, the most pedestrian materials imaginable, lined the corner space above his bed. Where were they? Her clothes were the same as the night before, except for a slight stiffness where they'd been sweated through and dried again. How many miles had they run? It had seemed as if the night would never be over, but now they were here, safe for the moment, in a new hiding place. Tariq, she swung her legs out of bed. It was stuffy in the room, and the cool cement felt good underfoot. Wake up, Tariq, Tariq. His eyes fluttered open just before he sat up fast. What's wrong, he asked. What's happened? Are the police here? No, nothing like that, she said. I don't think so. This wasn't a place they were supposed to know about. A dear friend at the camp outside of Najran gave her the name of the mosque. Just in case, he said, use the back door in the alleyway. Hala hadn't even told Tariq about the location until last night. It had been pitch dark when they came in. The lights were prohibited. Now a single high window was letting in just enough gray dawn to show her details she hadn't seen before. This was a storage room, wasn't it? There were boxes of paper and other office supplies, some canned goods, an enormous wooden lectern listing a bit to the side, like an old person who'd needed to use a cane. And what was this? She saw that her things had been brought from the hotel. Both suitcases, Tariq's laptop, and the black weapons case were stacked neatly by the room's only door. Is it safe to move around? Tariq asked. I suppose it is. Let's see. Hala stood up. They could at least change their clothes. She was halfway across the room when the door suddenly opened from the outside. Had someone been watching them all night? A portly woman, somewhere between middle-aged and old, walked in on them. You're awake, the woman said in Arabic. Good, we brought your suitcases here. She had a basin of water in both hands, still steaming hot. There were two hand towels on her shoulder and what looked like a blue silk hijab for Hala. Clothes from back home. As soon as you're ready, you can come and have breakfast with him, she said. She set the basin and towels on a chair, then turned to go. I'll just be outside. Excuse me, breakfast with who? Hala asked. The woman stopped, but only to look them over again assessing them in some way. Don't be too long, she said. He's waiting. Chapter 40 They were brought around through the darkened back of the mosque. Hala could hear the Fajr prayer coming through the walls as they moved quickly along, carrying their shoes. The housekeeper, or whatever she was, stopped at a tall carved door and let them inside, but she didn't follow. The breakfast was already set. Brother, sister, the man at the table greeted them also in Arabic. Come and sit, the coffee's getting cold. He was squat, like a man crossed with a toad, but his face was open and seemed friendly. He watched them come into the room with the kind of amused curiosity one usually reserved for a visit by children. 
It was only when they came closer that Hala noticed the wheelchair. The heavy table and his long shirt had obscured it until now. Thank you for having us, Sheik, Tariq said. We're very sorry for the imposition. We apologize. He waved their concern away. You are right to come here, he said. And I'm not the imam of this mosque. Just a family member like yourselves. You can call me uncle. Now, please, don't be so polite. I know you must be hungry. She was, but Hala still paused to take stock. The man, uncle, had scrambled eggs, pita, and jam on his plate. There were several other untouched dishes on the table. He picked up on it right away. Smart, he said, but completely unnecessary. What would you like me to try? The labne, she said, and the date spread. She didn't back down, and it seemed to please rather than antagonize uncle. His grin only broadened as he took large bites of both, then poured coffee for all three of them from the same pot. Very good. I'm impressed. Now, enough antics you can relax, he told them in a quiet voice that was also firm and reassuring. As they loaded their plates, Hala's mind came back to the night before. What about the others, she asked. Is everyone perfectly safe thanks to you, Uncle said. It seemed imprudent to complain about the mother bitch right now. The assignment didn't come off, she said instead. Yes, but not without some impact or the same, he answered. Two of their police officers are dead. That's a powerful symbol to the Americans. They both hate and love their police. The authorities are terrified, mostly because they don't know what to make of us. The kidnapping of the children has them baffled as well. He paused for a moment, then went on. Of course, we are responsible for that. Tariq passed her a piece of bread, smiling with his eyes. He was obviously proud that the family had already accomplished so much. Hala sipped her coffee. It was Arabic and not entirely hot, but delicious. She wanted to ask more about the president's children, but thought it would be wise to let Uncle take the lead on that subject. There will be other important assignments, Uncle went on casually. In fact, we'd like to reposition you. We're prepared to do this now, the sooner the better, as you know so well. We are at war. The words hung there in the air. I'm sorry, reposition? Tariq asked. Take charge of the next phase we have planned for the Americans. Part of it, anyway. He took a large manila envelope from the pocket on the back of his chair and slid it across the table. Go ahead, he said, smiling as though it were a personal gift. Take a look. Tariq tilted the envelope to empty its contents. A disc in a thin jewel case, two American passports, a car key, and an engraved hotel folio with a room entry card inside. There's a list of our targets there, Uncle said, indicating the disc. We will assemble a team for you. Whatever you like, whatever you need. Hala took it all in, searching her mind for an appropriate response. Thank you, Uncle, she said finally. We're honored. Don't be. For the first time there was a scowl on the man's face. This is about the family, not some American version of self-glorification. Hala felt embarrassed. Of course I understand, she said. Then the man's face turned again. He grinned that grin of his and winked as he took another bite of breakfast. But I do think you'll like the Four Seasons, he said. It is a very good hotel. Book Three War Chapter Forty One The kidnapper understood everything there was to understand about the case, and definitely more than the Washington police, the plotting Secret Service, and the painstakingly ineffective FBI. He watched them as they continued to search for any hint of a clue or evidence misplaced on the campus of Braniff School. They weren't going to find anything, though. He was certain of that. 
Record. I have been thinking, obsessing over these desperate measures for over two years and actually planning it for 14 months. I believe that I've covered my tracks, and the more I go over the details, the more confident I am that this will go down as one of the great unsolved cases in history. A school bell rang. Just then. Lunch. He slid the tape recorder into a trouser pocket and decided to stroll out onto the school campus to parade among the still nervous students and teachers, but also the cops who were there performing their tireless yet pointless interviews. Talk to me, just me, he couldn't help thinking. As he strolled along, he noticed a tall MPD detective, a striking figure, an obviously confident man. He knew this one had read all about his becoming part of the investigation. This detective had a success record that was some cause for concern. The kidnapper didn't turn the tape recorder back on now, though his finger played over its shape. Still, he was recording inside his head. Record. One of the MPD detectives on the case solved a major kidnapping years ago. If I am as thorough as I believe I am, I have to admit that he's a danger to everything I've done, to all that I have accomplished, to the entire plan and its rewards. I feel this everywhere in my body. He's different from the others, just as I am different from my fellow man and woman. I think I know what I should do now. But can I do it? Can I kill Alex Cross? It's the right thing to do. Chapter 42 Just off the northwest corner of 6th and P Streets, a plain white van sat stationed at the curb. The aluminum ladder and PVC pipe on the roof rack masked an air vent, which in turn masked a six-millimeter lens taking live footage of the mosque across the street. FBI agent Cheryl Kravitz was on Periscope. She shifted the joystick control in her right hand, bringing the double front doors of the Masjid al-Qasim into focus, just as the early morning service began to let out. The sidewalk filled up quickly. There were more men than women by far, in everything from thobes and skull caps to Abercrombie t-shirts and patent leather high tops. But there were families, too, and a good number of couples. Kravitz was particularly interested in the couples. Is it just me, she asked? Or does this whole thing seem kind of... Open-ended? Her partner, Howard Green, kept his eyes on the console in front of him, where a bank of five small screens and two large ones showed various surveillance images. One of the big screens had a shot of the intersection patched in from a Department of Transportation camera on the stoplight just outside the van. The other showed what Kravitz was seeing. I was going to say racist, she went on. Here we go again. I mean, seriously, we have no idea what we're looking for here. Suspicious Muslims? Kravitz took her hand off the controls to air quote the last part. I don't even know which of these people are Saudi, or if that even matters. Nobody said suspicious Muslims, Green countered. They didn't have to, Kravitz said. We all know what they want us to do. Scan the brown faces for a while, see what we see, make sure everyone feels like we're on the job. We are on the job, Green said. How do you think this works? You prefer to sit around and wait for more Americans to die? Because you can bet your ass these bad guys aren't going to sit on their heels. All right, cool your jets, I'm just saying. Yeah, I got it the first couple times. ACLU is going to have their hands full before this thing is over, that's all. Agent Green reached down and took the last bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit from the greasy McDonald's bag at his feet. He knew he was better off not going there with Kravitz, especially this early in the day. The bureau was spread thin, and their relief wouldn't be coming for another ten hours, maybe more. Then, as Green looked up again, something caught his attention. It was a well-dressed couple coming out of the mosque at the back of the crowd. Nothing strange there, except they were both loaded down with luggage. What's with the suitcases, he said. Kravitz took her eye off the periscope to see what Green meant. He put a finger up to the screen. That couple, right there. The woman had stopped to lower her hijab. 
The man, clean-shaven, with a raven's cap on his head, took